I want to help make each one of our doctors the best doctor they could be and the best business person that they could be and as healthy as they could be so they could enjoy their life. They always say doctors are bad business people and the doctor is the worker. That's you know, right. people that's that have a business, they run their business. We're the worker. You know, right. so somebody else that you, you can't do both. Welcome to the Dare to Be Different podcast, where I interview the movers and the shakers within our industry. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing a longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Kerry Gelb. Dr. Gelb actually was one of my clinical instructors when I was a student. He was far beyond the times at the time, because in New York, we did not have any privileges to even use proparacaine. And Dr. Gelb was teaching us how to remove foreign bodies, knowing that was the future of, of optometry. And that's why I wanted to interview him today. So, Kerry, thanks so much and welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. It's good to see you, Nick. Thank you. So, yeah. Kerry, why don't you start from when you did your residency at St. Albans, I think. It was a medical residency. And then just fast forward your career since then. Yeah, so I did a, after optometry school, I did a VA residency for a year in at St. Albans with Murray Fingerette. Um, Murray Fingerette is a pretty well-known instructor, lecturer, uh, glaucoma specialist in optometry. And, uh, you know, that was a very good residency. Doing residency at the VA hospital, you, you saw many different types of diseases. And, uh, you know, I also rotated through the Brooklyn VA and downstate medical. So I would see a lot of crazy diseases from different countries. And I remember when I was in downstate. Uh, so downstate is a city hospital in Brooklyn. And we would see the craziest diseases there, but they had horrible equipment. Hmm. So, you know, you are limited. So to some amount by what kind of equipment you have. So there was a lot of guesswork going on, but, but uh, it was interesting. And, uh, you know, I was in with the surgical residents and I remember a quick story, you know, I was, I was a resident, an optometry resident with the ophthalmology residents at the VA in Brooklyn and George Gombos was the attending and he hated optometrists. He really wow. did, but I was there and, sure. But he liked me, but he hated optometrists. So he would go into, he would always ask questions. And he wrote a book on ocular emergencies. And I read his book. So wow. I knew all the answers to his questions. And the residents really didn't have any respect for him. So they never read his book and they never knew any of the answers. So whenever he needed something, he would go into a whole diatribe on how optometrists don't know anything. But then there was something complicated. And he goes, Kerry, you do it. You take out that weird foreign body. You do it. You're the only one here I trust. And there I am with the ophthalmology residents after he, after he went into 15 minutes on how optometrists don't know anything. So, you know, it's optometry has really grown uh, since I did my residency back in 1980 and 1984. But I was able to look into the future and see that, you know, as a physician and as as an optometrist, we're really in a position to almost be like an internist because we deal with a lot of systemic diseases. And in the movie that we did, as you can see behind me, Open Your Eyes, we talk about this close to 300 systemic diseases that can manifest in the eye. And as our technology is getting better, and now we have cameras where we could look at the retinal blood vessels at eight microns or 10 microns and did, you know, you know, we're in a position where we'll see changes, vascular changes way before That's it's right. seen in the bigger blood vessels. So we have to be in a position to know how to do labs and and to, to make early diagnosis and recommendations for preventative medicine. So, so you know, so that's where, really where I cut my teeth at the beginning and I got my philosophy because I always wanted to practice at the highest extent of my license and do what was best for my patients. So after my residency, I worked for an ophthalmologist for a while in the Bronx. Right. And then a friend of mine called me, uh, Fred Jerpy, uh, who some people on this, uh, watching this may know, uh, who is, who's retired, he lives in California now. And uh, he was a friend of mine who I went to optometry school and he called me up and he said to me, when I was working for this ophthalmologist, he goes, uh, 
you want you want lens crafters? He goes, I go, what's lens crafters? I never heard of lens crafters. Right. He goes, I can get you. You want to live in Florida? I get you all the lens crafters in Florida. You can be the head optometrist of lens crafters. I said, I never heard of lens. What is lens crafters? So he goes, this is going to be the biggest thing. I'm telling you, you know, there's a lot of money behind it. And, you know, but at the point I said, listen, I'm I'm living in New Jersey. I'm really not interested in moving to Florida at this point in my life. But, uh, you know, if an opportunity comes up in New Jersey, I, I would be interested you know, and certainly learning more about it. And and uh, so there was an opportunity in New Jersey to get a territory where at that time, you know, you could get as many as you wanted. And I remember speaking with the head optometrist who was one of the recruiters, along with Fred, who was an optometrist. And I remember him telling me, you could get whatever equipment you want. We just want you to be the best possible doctor you could be. Even though you're in a lens crafters, we want it to be, we want you to give the best possible care. And, you know, I gave him a list of indirect ophthalmoscopy and camera and all these things that I never thought they would buy. And whatever I wanted, they got for me. And there I was. I, you know, I started in Woodbridge, New Jersey in 1987. Still remember October 5th, 1987, starting in Lens Crafters. And I had all this great equipment and uh, people, I couldn't believe how busy it was. You know, we'd open the doors and, you know, you don't know if anyone's going to show up. Right. And it, you know, the lines were out the door and and it started from there. And and, uh, you know, and and, you know, so and I've been with Lens Crafters since October 5th, 1987. And it's been you know, it's been it's been a great journey, really. Uh, this, you know, look, whenever you're dealing with a big corporation, there's always going to be, you know, different leadership and, you know, th- people are going to have different philosophies. But as long as the philosophy is for us to give the best pos- possible patient care and to practice at the highest extent of our license, then, you know, I think that's a really good formula for success. Yeah. I'm just going to stop you for the audience. I just want to give a little background to get into that St. Albans uh, residency. There was very few residencies at the time. And the word was out. You don't want to do a Murray Fingerette. He was tough. He was tough on his residence. It was one of the toughest residencies out there. There wasn't few. And Kerry somehow got through that residency. He probably doesn't even remember this. But at the time, New York State did not have even diagnostic privileges. So Kerry was a visionary saying, you know, I see where optometry is going and I want to be at the forefront. In addition, when he started working in New Jersey, I would hear from all the retinal specialists that I referred to because we had diagnostics in New Jersey, but we didn't have therapeutics at the time. And all the retinal specialists, all of them you know, would say, do you know Dr. Kerry Gelb? Do you know Dr. Kerry Gelb? He catches retinal holes so far out in the periphery that our colleagues are not catching it. So Dr. Gelb's name as an optometrist, when diagnostics were just coming in the forefront in optometry, was among all the medical professionals without there. So you gained not only optometry's respect, but ophthalmology's respect when you did get out in the field. And then uh, you took on this lens crafters. And at the time, how many did you take on in 1987? So we, we started with one and then uh, we added East Brunswick. And then we added at, at, a little bit later on, we had uh, Freehold and then Edison and uh, we had Brooklyn for a while in Staten Island. We gave those back to lens crafters. So, uh, you know, I was involved in a number of, of lens crafters over the years. And it has fulfilled your life, obviously, because you've stayed with them for 30 plus years. Yeah, I mean, I, I as, long, as long as I could practice at the highest extent of my license, I could give the best possible care to patients. I'm happy. You know, the whole glass is part of it. You know, I really was not never that interested in any way. Right. So not doing glasses didn't really bother me at all. And lens so, crafters took care of the glasses. I took care of the medical eye exams and, and the general eye exams. And it was a, it was a perfect fit. And when our sons, you know, both my partner, Barry's son and my son were interested possibly in optometry, when they visited you, they were in awe of the equipment that you had in this exam room. They said, this guy practices at the highest level. So why don't you, we're going back 
literally 15 years ago when OCT was rarely heard of. Tell us a little bit about how thoroughly you practice medical optometry. You know, I always felt that, you know, to practice properly, you have to have the tools. So I was always willing to invest in the tools. And I had the first generation OCT. I probably had five different OCTs That's right. in my one office now because it keeps changing. I have angiography now. And, and you know, and probably the, the in addition to OCT, I have multispectral imaging. Unfortunately, I don't make it anymore. Uh, but hopefully they'll start, they're going to start making it again. And that really allows you to see the, the blood vessels at a very small level. And as I talked about this in the movie, I'm looking at the capillaries and I'm seeing these little ballooning spots in the capillaries. And I'm not sure what they are, but I'm very interested in integrative medicine, functional medicine. I've taken a lot of classes and, and uh, seminars on vascular biology. And, but, you know, I, I was asking the people back then, this company, Anitas, and all their experts and ophthalmologists, did anyone know what these things were? And nobody knew what they were, but I put two and two together and I said, I bet you it's from, it's insulin resistance, it's elevated insulin. So I sent them out for a series of blood tests. And sure enough, because elevated insulin is just as dangerous to the blood vessels as elevated blood sugar. So insulin happens first. And I would send them out for a series of blood tests. And sure enough, it correlated with, you know, if they weren't diabetic yet, if they weren't on the diabetic yep. spectrum, it correlated with elevated insulin. And at that point, you know, we would, you know, adjust their diet and lifestyle. And but we we published that study in 2016. Uh, I published it with Stu Richer, with a cardiologist, uh, Jeffrey Gold and uh, Jerry Sherman. And it showed that the these little uh, microaneurysms in the capillaries of the eye correlated with insulin resistance. And it kind of puts an optometrist as our technology is getting better because you can see them on OCT and geography. So it, it, it puts us in a position that if we're seeing this, we could, we could help prevent someone from becoming diabetic. You know, it picks up other things as well. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many little tiny hemorrhages I would have missed without this without this instrument. So I'm just hoping that it comes back and uh, because it really is it really is a, a great instrument and really that combined with OCT because that the multispectral imaging is a is a screening test that could be done on everybody where OCT can be a screener and I know some people use it that way. I use it really as uh, you know more as, as a diagnostic rather than for screening, but everybody has a different philosophy in the way they practice. But I feel that, uh, you know, that's how it helps me. But I've, you know, I, of course I have, uh, you know, I, I have a B, you know, I was early in getting a B scan, Very early. you know, for all the people out there with Optimaps, they're picking up all these choroidal nevuses, but, you know, you want to do a B scan on it because you, you know, you want to follow, you know, the, 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 uh, criteria to make sure that somebody doesn't get the ABCDs uh, uh, ruling out melanoma uh, that was that, that was uh, from Will's Eye Hospital uh, that that they published. So, you know, you see the nevus, it's good to have a B, B scan is really not that expect, expensive. I have specular microscope, you know, I have right eye now. So, you know, I try to have the technology and aberrometry. You know, I can't tell you how many times I'll see a patient that, you know, they don't see good and, you know, you think there's nothing wrong, but it's really that their cornea is warps either right. from wearing their contact lenses. And I just had somebody the other day that's been to like five doctors and they, you know, they, you know, they keep fitting with different contact lenses. And it's really the guy's, the kid is, he's a minus eight with four doctors a cylinder and he's over wearing his contact lenses. And, you know, by having amberometry, he was really helping. It was really pretty easy because I have the technology. So it makes me look good. Right. But, you right. know, if you have the technology, it's easy to, to look good. Yeah. And, and so you've used the volume of patients you've seen to really study and, and work optometry like you wanted to. Why don't you tell the audience how you order these blood tests? You know, blood testing and analyzing the blood tests more than some of the internists I work with. What sparked your interest in that area of optometry? 
<clears throat> so be uh, before when I talked about the melan ruling out melanomas, is Jerry Shields and Carol Shields. That's right. Who uh, came up with that? So uh, as far as blood tests, well, I realized, you know, from taking these classes that you're going to have to do. If you see these microaneurysms or you see little hemorrhages. I think every optometrist out there has probably been in the position where they see a dot hemorrhage or some kind of hemorrhage. Right. They send it to an internist and they say there's nothing wrong with the patient. People don't get hemorrhages for no reason. You just got right. Unfortunately, there's like a thousand different mar markers. So you have to know which, which test to do. So, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, learning and studying blood tests. I actually gave a lecture for OD wire. A, a while ago with a cardiologist on blood tests, but, you know, it's not only, you know, diabetes that could cause uh, little hemorrhages. It could be high homocysteine, high, fib high fibrinogen, uh, very elevated platelets. I mean, so you want to make sure high insulin, sure. Uh, you know, two hour insulin, sometimes it could be. So, you know, so I really spent a lot of time because I was fascinating with fascinated with it and really at a necessity of referring patients over and over again, and them telling me there's nothing wrong with the person. Right. I know that pe people aren't getting hemorrhages for no reason. There's not nothing wrong with somebody. I remember when we went to school way back when, if you saw peripheral hemorrhages, they said, well, that's normal. You know, peripheral hemorrhages are normal, but peripheral hemorrhages are not no. normal. A friend of mine uh, had peripheral hemorrhages uh, and he goes, well, I got peripheral hemorrhages. I go, well, you're you know, you're probably insulin resistance. We need to do some of these blood tests. He goes, well, the retina guy told me not to worry about it. And sure enough, three years later, the guy's diabetic. Right. You know? right. So, I mean, so you just have to know the right blood test to do. Right. They're not innocuous. So you really have practiced optometry in my eyes at the highest level. So that brings me to myopia management because that's my forte. That's my interest. And I know you've been fitting like the CRT lens, I think, from when it first got FDA approved, correct? Back in 2002, almost 20 years ago? Yeah, I actually was one of the first ones to do it. I remember when they came out, Paragon came out with, with CRT. And, you know, people were doing ortho K for years before it was FDA right. approved. And uh, But I wasn't doing it before it was FDA approved. I, I Well, when it became FDA approved... Uh, not that I have anything about against doing things off label because, you know, as physicians, we have to do things off label. That's true. Only about, you know, I think the statistics is about 16% of what physicians do. There's been a randomized controlled trial. So we have to do, we have to prescribe Tobradex sometimes when, you know, there's no clinical trial. I mean, we have to do what's best for the patient or, we, you know, we have to fit a contact lens a certain way. And I don't think there's any clinical trials on refracting. I, I never saw a clinical trial on the best way to refract, but right. I did do it when CRT came out and it just made a lot of sense to me, you know, because, you know, here's an alternative to refractive surgery and, uh, and I, and I did it. And I was getting great results. That's the thing is that, you know, sometimes you'll do things and if you're not getting really good results, you're not going to do it because, you know, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with people's lives and sure. people's money and, and time and, and your time. And, and, you know, so you want to make sure you're doing something that works. And I remember the first CRT patient uh, I had, uh, they were probably, they were in the threes. I remember they were in the minus threes. I don't remember exactly, but I remember putting the lenses on and telling them to go take a walk in the mall, come back in an hour. And I take the lenses out and they go from like minus 350 to minus 150. I know, and I said, holy cow, this is amazing. I mean, <laughs> remember the parents were like blown away who, who was doing it. And it was just like, this is something. And uh, I just kind of started from there and I, I do quite a bit of it. And, and, you know, I certainly enjoy it. And, you know, we're doing it. We're really doing a good thing for the patients. I mean, it's, it's really uh, patients are very happy. The parents are happy. And now that we have all these studies that right. confirm that things that we already knew that it could slow the progression of myopia, or, you know, probably close to 70 percent, you know, the studies show. So I think it's probably more than that because I had patients that have been doing it since 2003 and they had a family, a parent that is a minus 11. And I started when they were in their threes or twos. And, you know, but they're still wearing CRT, you know, I haven't washed them out, but, 
you know, and they're very happy wearing it. Yes. And, you know, and I've had patients that have do, that have become presbyopic that have been wear, using CRT and they get some kind of, sometimes they get some kind of reading effect and they're able That's to true. read. I'm not even sure why, but it, it works. And, and they, you know, because of the way that, the cornea is the spherical operation, I guess. I, I'm not really sure. You know better than me, but they, they they could read. And, you know, I have a patient who's 60 and I started doing CRT when, you know, in 2003 and she still doesn't need reading glasses and she, and she can see 2025 to 2020. She really right. doesn't have much of a refractive error. Right. So if you do CRT and you do it right, it's very rewarding. And of course we know about all the things that it could possibly prevent is, you know, cataracts, as as, macular degenerate, myopic macular yeah. degeneration, retinal detachment, et cetera. But the, the, the point here is that you started it 20 years ago, give or take, and you're still doing it. A lot of people tried it, dabbled in it, ran into some roadblocks, which I'm sure you have, but yet your personality is, this is working. I just got to learn how to work it. So it shows you a level of perseverance that it seems to have transcended through your career is this ability to make a decision and keep sticking with that decision, even though I'm sure you've reached a lot of barriers along the way. Absolutely. Am I correct? Yeah. You know, you have to have a passion for it and you have to keep learning. And, you know, and if you're innovative and you're doing you're studying. I always tell my doctors what, that work for me, you know, I still see patients four days a week, but I tell my doctors that come and work with me that, you know, I'm paying you to be smart. Okay. When you're, when we have downtime, I want you to study. Wow. I wow. want you to be smart. Wow. You know, and, uh, you know, you know, we don't so glad. I don't want you, we don't have to push anything here. I just want you to do what's best for the patient and be as smart as you can and everything will fall into place. Yeah. So that brings me to your role as a leader. And I wanted to spend some time with that topic is that why don't you tell us what all docs is? Because I've spoken for your group once or twice, and both times you were the president, you were the leader of this organization. And I was enamored by how you're able to instill your ethics, your ability to grow onto the onto the doctors that you're really leading. So what is All Docs? And, and tell us if you've been the president, how long you've been the president for. So All Docs was a uh, was an acronym coined by a past president, Harf Sylvan, Dr. Harf Sylvan, uh, a good friend. And it means Association of Lens Crafters Leaseholding Doctors. And so we're the leaseholders uh, that work with lens crafters and we have an organization and I'm the president of the organization. And I remember when I took over as president, you know, you know, there was some turmoil, some turmoil between corporate and and all docs at the time. And I came out of the bathroom and they go, you're president. <laughs> what year was that? <laughs> oh, that was about 15 years ago. Wow. <laughs> I don't remember the year exactly, but about 15 years ago. And I remember, you know, we were on, we were in some meeting. I think we were in Canada or something. And. I said, okay, well, if I'm going to be president, you know, I used to just be a board member and I used to go to all the meetings and, you know, enjoy all the, been through all the trips and it was all right. fun. I really, I got to say, I really didn't do a lot at that point. I just kind of gave my opinion and and now they're telling me I'm president. I said, okay, well, things are going to change because if I'm wow. president, I'm going to, I'm going to change the direction of the organization. We're going to make the organization bigger. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, and I'm going to change the philosophy and my philosophy is really I want to help make each one of our doctors the best doctor they could be and the best business person that they could be and as healthy as they could be so they could enjoy their life because you know you know you know we have we have to work you know a lot of hours and we're responsible to be there seven days a week so you know if we can't find somebody you're the one there so uh, so we want people to be healthy and smart and be good business people so to to you know not only to be to for good financially but to 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 be healthy uh from a mental point of view because it's a very it could be a very difficult job and to that end you just you get these speakers to come you pay them several thousand dollars 
to come to speak to your doctors about maintaining their emotional health, maintaining their physical health. So you, it's just not lip service you're providing to these doctors, correct? Yeah. So a number of years ago, I decided that, you know, I'm very interested in integrative medicine and health and keeping myself healthy. So I figured, well, if I'm interested in, you know, I think most people will be interested in it. And I want to bring this to, to my members. So I, so I, I brought, you know, famous people that are an optometrist to speak to our, to our group. You know, I brought like p- people like, uh, Nicholas Gonzalez, uh, uh, you know, people that have, you know, he was an expert in cancer. I brought, I brought people that have been experts in Dale Bredesen, who is an expert in Alzheimer's disease. So I brought different types of people with different types of backgrounds to speak to our group. Uh, Mimi Granary, who is a, who is a cardiologist, just to give kind of a different philosophy, because I think it's important as optometrists that we are very we we are a very integral part of the healthcare system, whether we sometimes whether we realize it or not. And the more you could be part of that healthcare system, the better job you're going to do for your patients, the better respect you're going to get from your your non-optometric colleagues. You know, I, I'm in the movie Derek De Silva, who's in the movie, who's who's also who's an intern who spoke to the group. He goes, I never knew that you guys do any of this stuff. Right. You know, he goes, I didn't know I what an optometrist was. He goes, I'm a physician. I have no idea what you guys do. And I think that's one of the problems with optometry. And one of the reasons we made the movie Open Your Eyes, a documentary. And one of the reasons I do my uh, podcast also, my Open Your Eyes podcast, is it's for the public and for the doctors because I, I interview some very smart doctors like yourself, like Barry Iden, you know, so many very uh, brilliant optometrists. And I, and I also interview uh, vision scientists, ophthalmologists, uh, different topics, and it, the people in integrative medicine, such as Alan Christensen on thyroid, you know, everything pretty much affects the eye. So, uh, and I just want the, the public to know what we do, that we're not just glasses, we're not just a refraction. Right. We're, we have this whole health part of it that by going to an optometrist, you're really, you know, you 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 it's more, it's a more of a gestalt and we're very an important part of the healthcare system. So, uh, but getting back to all docs, you know, so we try to bring people, very high people who have written books in, in, in marketing and in practice management and, and, and in the health field. And, uh, you know, we've had Robert Lustig. He's been on 60 Minutes. He's written a number of books. He wrote books on fructose. And, you know, now I'm, I'm in with a lot of these people. And uh, so we, 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 get, we get some really good speakers. And, and, and our doctors will come up to me when I'm done and say, you know, I really want to thank you for bringing this speaker, for bringing Dr. Lustig or, you know, bringing one of the doctors. They changed my life. I lost 30 pounds. I'm a lot happier. And I'm hearing this from my doctors who are part of my membership. And, you know, and that, you know, money can't money can't buy that. I mean, when no, people come up no. and tell me that, you know, because of something I've done, it's changed their life, whether it's my patient or one of our doctors, you know, that is, you know, that that's what, that, that's what make, keeps me going. So if I hear your leadership style correctly, you want them to be the best optometrist. They can be the best business person they can be. And also teaching them or helping them maintain better health personally, emotionally health, healthy, and physically healthy. Is that how you maintain your leadership? Because I'm sure there's rumblings among the group. It's hard, or it's impossible to get consensus from everyone. How do you keep everyone focused on a common vision so you can lead them? You know, I my philosophy on being a, a leader, it just kind of you know, it kind of comes natural to me, you know, because hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm very innovative. You know, I look at myself as an innovative person. So I'm always looking for what's new, what's next. How can I improve myself? I'm always learning. I'm studying all the time. I listen to podcasts uh, to learn about uh, topics, uh, health, nutrition, 
I'm doing my Open Your Eyes podcast. Um, you know, I'm always learning. I think that's really important. I think when you're learning, it helps you become more innovative. And then you have to have the courage to take some risks. And yeah, am I going to make some mistakes? I'm going to make mistakes. You know, I yeah. brought speakers. You know, I think most of the speakers I have brought, people are happy with. But I brought some that have, <laughs> you know, that have, you know, that it's very controversial. Of course. And uh, that some people didn't like. But But I'm willing to take a risk. I'm willing to take a risk, whether it's in my practice, to bring in a new piece of equipment. And, you know, I, ha I have a growth mindset. But also, I, I try to be very empathetic to our members, you know, as whether I'm running my office. You know, I, you know I've seen coaches, as my son is a 12-year-old and he plays baseball. And, you know, it, it's almost like we're a coach in a way. And, you know, do, do am I going to sit and yell at my staff all day? No. Is that the best way to do it? And I've seen coaches yell at the kids and right, you know, that right. doesn't work. It doesn't really. work. The best way is to, I think, is really you want to have, you want to listen to what people have to say. You want to let, you know, let them do their job. You know, they are sometimes are going to make mistakes, but you're going to discuss it. And you really want to be empathetic. You want to put yourself in their shoes and realize that, you know, that, you know, we're, we're all working together. And whenever a, a, a doctor comes up to me and says, Kerry, I want you to bring this speaker or I want you to try to do this, it's very important to me that I listen and I try to do what they're asking me to do. And because uh, I want I want them to have open communication. You know, right. I want to collaborate. I want to have that open trust, you know, and I and I have the passion to, to try to do what's best for, for my members. And okay. I, at the same time, you know, I'm, I feel like I, I want to be accountable, and, but I'm always, my ear is always open uh, and I'm listening. And I think those okay. are things that really will make somebody a good leader and a good coach, whether I'm running my office, you know, or I'm running, you know, I'm running or I'm working with Lenscrafters in my office. I've had staff, you know, obviously you have to weed out you know, the bad staff. Sure, the, sure. The good staff, you know, people stay with me for years, 15 years, 20 years. You know, uh, I have people with me since 1980, uh, October 5th, 1987, when I opened. Unbelievable. You know, because, you know, because I just want to be, treat people the way I want to be treated. And, uh, and really, I just really just try to be nice to people. And, and I know you've helped me with your honesty because you do want to help. Like I start out in practice. I came to you. I had a staff member steal from me and say, Nick, this is going to happen. It's happened to me. You know, if your systems are not tight. So you're not, you just don't pontificate. You, you empathize with me, very honest with me. You said, Nick, this is going to happen in business. And you said, this is what happened to me. This is how you avoid it. And I guess the, the members that you're leading, like you said, they don't expect perfection from you. They're just expecting this vision and you trying to be as honest and empathetic as possible so they can kind of follow you or trust you, really. Exactly. You know, and I think they follow the passion. They do. The mutual respect, respect. We try to problem solve together. So there's a lot of good things that go on. Yeah, it was one thing I've learned from, from doing this podcast a short time is the leaders that I've been interviewing have said the same exact thing. They have failed. They have failed numerous times. But their successes outnumber their failures, and those failures never stop them from moving forward. Yes, every failure is an opportunity. So, <laughs> yes, it is. You know, so we, we're all going to make mistakes, and uh, you know, hopefully, we learn from them and we become better people, and uh, it doesn't cause us to lose too much sleep. Yeah. Well, listen, I think today the students are better students than I were, was in, in school, and they're afraid to make mistakes. And so they are afraid to lead because you are going to, to, to fall. And that growth mindset is Carol DeWick from, from Stanford is she writes about the growth mindset is that it develops with stumbling. It's, it's a part of growth. If you're not stumbling, if you don't feel you're an imposter, quote unquote, then you're not, you're not growing because you're, you have to move out of your comfort zone. You know, it's funny because my next podcast on Tuesday, I'm interviewing Walter Beatty, who's a who's a baseball coach. Okay. His son is in the major leagues uh, wow. who plays for the, uh, I think he plays for the car. The, he played, he was drafted by San Francisco and 
Uh, I'm not sure who he plays for now, but he plays for a different team now. But anyway, he talks a lot about, you know, it's not about failing. It's always about learning. And uh, and it's the same thing with us. You know, we're kind of like coaches in a way. Right. Absolutely. So let's talk about Open Your Eyes documentary and Open Your Eyes podcast, because this blew me away. About three, four years ago, you say, Nick, I'm doing this documentary <laughs> It's 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 really a, a very a deep documentary where I've traveled literally around the world to to kind of educate the public on the benefits of optometry and good vision care. Not optometry, good vision care. Can you start with the seed that was planted in your mind that you wanted to do this documentary and what it took to get it to where it is today? So uh, the ver- the documentary is on Amazon Prime. Uh, Google, you can see it on Google uh, uh, documentaries. Uh, so you know the 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 it's it, it's out there. I mean, you could you could see the the Apple TV. So the, it's you can watch the mo- movie. And if you do watch it, please give it a, a review. The more reviews, the more people watch it, the better it is for optometry. But the reason we did the movie is you know three four years ago, you know we were looking at the disruptors in the industry. And, you know, I feel that we don't have a very strong voice telling the public about what we do. So we need a a way, you know, because if you just have one voice telling the public, you don't need to get your eyes examined. You just have to look at your cell phone and we're going to examine your eyes and we're going to change your prescription and we're going to give you the contact lenses and you don't have to stay with the same contact lenses you're wearing. We're going to substitute it with maybe a contact lens that's not done by one of the four companies that have put in probably billions of dollars of R&D. You know, we're going to use some inexpensive contact lens, maybe from Malaysia or, or some other co- country. And, and But the people aren't hearing our side. They're only hearing that side. Nobody right. knows our side. So why counter. should they go to us? I mean, uh, if, all we're, if they could do what we could do with a cell phone, they don't know the whole medical part of what we do. They right. don't know that there's close to 300 systemic diseases that could be that we could find in the eye. Many times we're the first one to find it. So that how we could help patients and prevent them from and all the ocular diseases, you know, that we could see. Uh, and so, but people don't know it. And if they don't, if we don't tell them, they're not going to know. So you know, and so we decided that. We're going to try to do that. We're going to put, do a movie. Uh, and I had, I had a friend who, who does move, who makes movies. Hmm. I went and approached him and it's actually a friend of my friend. He, he, you know, I watched, you know, I'm into hell. So I watched this movie cut poison and burn. It was about cancer. And I really liked the movie. He did, he does a lot of sports with uh, basketball or whatever. And he did kids sports with baseball and, you know, I really liked his style. So we went and we spoke with him and, and, you know, he had to learn optometry, you know, he knew nothing about what we did. And, you know, as a movie maker, you got to learn the field. And I remember the first thing he went to was, uh, was vision expo back in, you know, 2000 and I think 18 it was. And, you know, here he is, he has to learn the profession. Right. One thing led to another, we started traveling and we went to different countries and we, the movie has a lot of different uh, subplots, you know, it has something for everybody. We have the centenarians. So we have something in the about centenarians, why they live so long. So we were in Nicoya, Costa Rica, examining one of the blue zones, examining the centenarians and finding out why they don't get macular degeneration. There are a hundred, but why are we getting macular degeneration right. in the West? And then we had the whole myopia part that we talked about. We and then we went to Budapest, and we interviewed uh, Dr. Zolt from Budapest on myopia control, and one of the doctors in Costa Rica. So, so, so you know, so and then we had the whole nutrition part of it. You know, uh, keeping your body healthy and how the eyes related to systemic disease. And then we have like a a very small uh, animation in the movie. So when somebody is watching the movie, they can watch it with their children who like animation. And while they're watching, they can learn about health and nutrition. So the 
you know, the 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 forty year old crowd are, is interested in the health and the nutrition part of it, and and you know, so <clears throat> there's something for everybody in the film, and it's fast paced, and you learn a lot from watching the film, and the whole idea is really to have the optometric community maybe play it in their office. They could all play it in Amazon Prime, Apple TV, Google Play, and play it in their office so the patients can see it. When the patients are watching it, they a lot of times they go when they want to watch the movie because they like it. They see five minutes of it while they're waiting there. Or tell patients, go and see the movie because the more people that see the movie, it's not to promote me. It's to promote our profession. That's why I did the film. Not only it's it's to promote, I've seen it, I've sent it out to so many of my referral sources, primary care docs, specialists, physical therapists. They've all come back and said, I've learned something. And, and they were very, very enamored by basically for themselves, to be honest with you, that the lifestyle we're living today is not a healthy lifestyle. And you went into depth with this by visiting, like you said, these blue zones and visiting people who don't have a lot of the common disease that we have in modern society. And the question is why? So I, I recommend every listener to watch it. I'm sure they'll enjoy it and it will benefit them in particular as much as their patients. Yeah. And, you know, and the podcast just go kind of goes along with it because you know, I started, the, they told me you should do a podcast to go along with the movie. And I remember right. I started doing the podcast. I wasn't very good at it. You know, now I'm used to it. So I've gotten a lot better at it. But but it's really not about me. It's about the, the guest and, you know, the preparation. And I do a lot of preparation for the pro podcast. And, uh, you know, so it's almost like a mini medical school on that one little topic when we do the, the Open Your Eyes Absolutely. podcast. Absolutely. I strongly recommend it. So let's close on this. You've been in practice now well over 30 years. A lot of our colleagues are retiring, right? It's a big buzz. This one retired. This one sold this practice. This one, she's she's uh, calling it quits. I don't see that in you. I see a lot of passion. Where are you at now? You're still practicing optometry. You're still innovating. You're still buying equipment. Are you thinking about retirement? Where's your mind at today? Oh, that's a, that you know. That's a great question. You know, I, you know, I wouldn't mind maybe s slowing down a little bit, but <laughs> optometry is is me. You know, yes. taking care of patients. You know, and I often say, you know, I'm a optometrist. I'm an eye doctor first, a business person second. You know, I'm, some people are business person first and an optometrist second, or a doctor second. They always say doctors are bad business people, and one of the reasons doctors are bad business people right. is because the doctor is the worker. That's you know, right. people That's that have a business, they run their business. We're the worker. You know, right. so somebody else, that, you, know, you can't do both. So, you know, that's why you need such good people that you could trust. And that's why, as you brought up, there's going to be theft because we don't really run our business. We're the worker. That's so, right. but uh, I love what I do. I love optometry and you know, maybe I'll slow down a little bit, get, you know, do more into podcasting. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I've gotten some opportunities to, you know, to do uh, regular podcasting on on uh, on some podcast channels. So we'll see what 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 happens in the future. But I'm always my interest is really is to promote optometry and teach the public about what we do and teach our students and, and review for our colleagues some of these great topics in our great profession. Well, Kerry, you know, you, you've played a big role in my career, you know, early on and throughout you walk, your talk, you epitomize uh, that it, no matter where you practice, how you practice, it's up to you to set your own standards and your standards have been remarkably high uh, throughout your tenure. And that's motivated me to be the best I can be. So I want to thank you very much getting up early this morning, sharing some clinical pearls and also some emotional pearls with the audience. It's really has been an honor to have you on today. Nick, thanks for having me. You've always been a good friend, a great colleague, and I admire you as well. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody, you've been listening to the Dare to Be Different podcast. Remember, it's your life, your practice, your way. Have a great day.